today we will be playing Minecraft. So, oh, I haven't been in this for like a while. Did you do anything new? Yeah, we've got an entire second half of the castle. Oh, damn! Um, all the roofs are on, bar about three or, or so. Haven't done a lot of decorating, nice. though. Not, uh, not feng shui'd it. I mean, that's okay. Where are you, by the um, way? Well, I, I'm on floor two. Um, just come off a bridge, uh, heading down some stairs. Whereabouts are you? Might be easier if I find you. I was by the... by our house. Where oh, we you're by the hut. Okay, yes. I'll come. I'll come to the hut. I did have um, I did have some maps up at one point that showed the entire thing, but a creeper got them. To be fair, I can see like the bit we built. Yeah, oh, there's yeah. also those two maps at the uh, top are filled as well. So yeah, so what are we building here? We're we're building Hogwarts. This is uh, <laughs> this is my quarantined uh, jigsaw puzzle. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, what? how long has this been? Three weeks now they've been doing Three this? Three weeks, has it? Shit. Sure. Maybe even more, because I, I think I played for two weeks with you. So you, you did most of the work, now. I just did. Why? Oh, I seem obsessive with this now, is it? Three weeks? Shit. Sure. Nah, come on. It's fun. No, it is fun. I mean, to be fair, we all have video games we this play every day. This definitely so. hasn't become a laborious task that I just can't give up. I mean, yeah. I've also enslaved some sheep over here. <laughs> Got a nice little oh, battery nice. farm going. As you do. I mean, you are from Wales. Ah, fuck off. <laughs> I'm not. I'm from England. I won't tell you exactly whereabouts in England, because I am ashamed of that fact, but I'm definitely, the Welsh definitely part of not England. from Wales. No, no. My, mother, my mother's <laughs> Welsh. My, I am half Welsh, but I do also have the right side of the blood in me as well. I've got no Welsh blood or English blood in me, so how do you handle hanging? Oh, I was just about to ask if you want some, but that's a bit creepier then. <laughs> <laughs> do you want some Welsh yeah, blood? that didn't quite uh... follow, does it? Okay, so I think that's a perfect way for us to start this interview session with you. So the way I want to do this is like we play at the same time. So if you want, if you want to, if you still want to focus on some building and stuff, or if you want to kind of take me on a trip around the, I guess the Hogwarts area, we can do that. And then meanwhile, I'll be asking you some questions. I mean, yeah, I may just ignore you now and again to build. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, no, fair. No, I, I, I shan't do that. So first things first. So how long have you been playing, and why the hell did you join this um, weird sport that we're in? So. I started in 2012, September. I believe it was September the 17th. Um, I found out... Pres oh, damn. You well, I, I looked actually. it up for something not long ago. It's when we were doing the quizzes for the uh, isolation quizzes from the Olympians page. I needed to figure out who had been playing longer, either me or Emily uh, Hayes. And it turned out I beat mm -hmm. Emily Hayes by about six months. I thought it was going to come down to the day. It did not. Um, so that was a useful, a uh, useless bit of knowledge that I picked up about when I started, uh, the 17th of September, but, um, 2012. So that makes it, I think, eight years? Almost. Oh, almost, almost eight, eight years. years. Wow. Yeah, eight years. Well, about seven and a half years, I think, isn't it? So this is... Damn. This is my eighth season. But, um, yeah. I mean, I stupidly, um... When picking universities, I actually saw that they had a uh, Quidditch society um, in the list that was sent to my uh, my high school. Okay. So I was I was I was already quite curious about what the hell it was. I mean, 2012, there wasn't really any footage online about Quidditch and all that. So at that point, I didn't know if it was going to be like a card game society or anything like that. I was one of the least sporty people I think there is really in terms of what I used to do. I play a bit of bag um bit of uh, basketball. I mean it's the same thing. They've got hoops and they've got, you know, balls they have to put through the hoops, so it's the same idea. Yeah, right? a little bit. I mean like I was supposed to be on my uh my school basketball team. You know, a North Walian basketball team was always going to be, you know, great success, but um <laughs> because I I didn't like football and I wasn't on the football team and didn't try out for the football team. I was banned from uh, being on the basketball team for some reason. Don't know why. I was... What? How does that work? I honestly don't know. I think because they were very proud of their football team. Um, uh -huh. That they kind of... There was this assumption that everyone on the football team must be, a, you know, like a great athlete or whatever. I mean, like, two members of it now are now in the uh, Championship League. So, you know, they, they did. Oh, no way. Yeah. Uh, one of them I threw over a wall once. Um... <laughs> in in a little bit of a little bit of a tiff he um i mean he's a dick he recently just crashed his uh, car in a drunk driving accident so i think i okay so i guess people can look it up and see who actually th sam threw over the yeah wall. i mean if you want i think he's <laughs> owned by everton or something like that and rented out to someone but i can't remember nice um wait is that so is that what guarantees success you just get gotta get sam 
to throw you over something and yeah. then you instantly become professional in your field. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, you should have said that earlier. Shouldn't I mean? I want, I want to become a football player as well. Yeah, well, if it wasn't for your knee, I would have. I mean, also the size <sighs> difference. This guy is actually. That's true. You know, I I don't like admitting, but he's probably a lot lighter than I was, so it was a bit easier for me to throw him than him to throw me. We we didn't get on in school, and that happened. I forgot what the question was. Oh yeah, why I started quitting. Yeah. Oh, that was it. Um, because uh, well, I so. I was at uh, Serendipity, which is what we called our freshers' fair in uh, Bangor, and um, while I was there, I found the I, well, I, I was looking for the Quidditch table, and I found it very easily because they were all wearing like you know the big pointy witches' hats. Oh, so was that part of Quidditch? Oh God, yes. Um, it was the KP side. They were all um, you know I, it was things like Emily Orterbridge and um, a couple of other uh, female players from uh, from Bangor. Um, where, you know, they're all about five foot two, five foot three, wearing capes and big pointy hats and sort of like with Harry Potter scarves and all that. And I, I saw that and I thought, holy shit, this will be hilarious. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I'd met Andrew Hull um, on the first day. Um, sorry, not on the first uh, on the first day that the uh, drama societies. Oh, this is Slytherin. The first day the drama societies had all uh, started up. We met each other, and Andrew was like this big, lumbering, very nervous, very shy giant. Absolutely lovely, lovely person. Um, I'm sure a lot of people, if anyone's interested from the Quidditch world who's listening, know that Andrew is one of the best players there ever has been out of Europe. Um, but he was he was this shy giant of a man who was just so lovely that we got on very well. And we just so happened to meet up at the Quidditch uh, Taster Session as well. So there's me and him kind of just like, they're like, what the hell are we doing here? This is ridiculous. Whereas at the start you had Emily Orterbridge, who, again, a lot of people know Emily Orterbridge as being one of the first coaches of Quidditch uh, Team UK and all that, being very, uh, very big in the coaching industry there for the sport. Uh, she comes out, as I say, this tiny little lady. Uh, she was wearing these big, thick glasses. And sort of like this, this little cardigan type, you know, it's like a sporty cardigan, I would call it. But like, you know, she was all wrapped up and sort of like walked out and she starts giving this spiel about sort of like, oh, this is going to be a full contact sport. It's going to be rough. You've got to be tough to do it. And we're, we're all sat there, you know, like, my, you know, I wasn't a particularly big guy, but you got people like Andrew Hull, Ben Honey, um, you know, some, some large players. These big guys watching this tiny little lady walking up and down, sort of like giving this war, war-esque spiel. And then she decides to demonstrate some of the physicality of the sport. And In the hall? In the... No, no, oh no, we, uh, this is, we're in a field at this time. So we're, we used to train at this place called the, uh, the Stone Circle, which um, was like, it was on the edge of a forest this pitch which was at like a 45 degree angle um like so you could feel like flying yeah oh god it was awful you jump? well the first time we ever had a game it was against keel and what happened is we all got on the pitch and we all you know we all started running and we started lifting to the left because we we're all used to oh, running no. like up the hill so it was, you know it did it did get you a bit it got your ankles it did wonders to be fear. fair that was like the perfect the perfect segue, because I was going to ask you at some point, it's one of my questions, that, like, what's the worst place you played, quote-unquote, competitive Quidditch? Worst place? Oh, God. Um, yeah. So would it not be that? No, no. Oh, well, I mean, that was bad. Like, the pitch was, um, it was like silt. So, like, they had, like, clay pitches, which, Whoa. so, like... Oh, magic. Oh, yeah, you go through the thing. They had, like, clay pitches. Nice. So, like, you'd, um, you'd stand on it and you'd just slip, like, like fucking anything. But the worst pitch was probably uh, White Knights 1. Um, when, so when was this? That was in Reading. That was the end of 2012. And um, in the middle of the pitch, there was a manhole cover. No. I always, oh, God, yeah. Like, and the way that we discovered it was one of the players, I think, sort of like skid across it, um, doing a bit of damage oh, so, to a knee. So was it covered by grass or something? Or no, what? we just didn't see it. Like, oh damn! It was once once you knew it was there. It was like, oh yeah, there's a manhole cover there. Look at that. Um, you know, it was a big grey and brown thing in the middle of the pitch. Damn. Um, and the best thing is, 
if I remember correctly, we didn't move the pitch. We just put cones around it so people could see it. I mean, to be fair, that's how we deal with, like, if you find poop on the training pitch. Oh, yeah, that's exactly you, what you do. Yeah, but, I mean, to be fair, you're not going to smash your, your kneecaps in if you slid on poo, are you? I mean, you could always, like, start digging up the manhole cover if you're really, if you're really keen. Yeah, I mean, anything would have been better. <laughs> like, putting a coat over it would have been better. Like, at least then you've got a tiny bit of sponginess to it. But, yeah. But, you know, we didn't. Wow. But, I mean, to be fair, that that's probably my favourite tournament. Not only because we were the first team ever to beat um, Oxford in that tournament. Um, <laughs> oh, no! Did you fall? I just fell. Yeah, I haven't put the handrail in yet. Here, man. I, I should. I just I haven't got around to it. It's a work in progress. <laughs> But no, okay, but yeah. we, um, we stayed at um, at uh, Jade Jade Saunders' house, which was a farmyard. They had a mm -hmm. you know they had a, like a house in the middle, like a second house, and we all stayed in that for a week. And we just had this big training camp for a week. That nice. was one of the most fun things I've ever done. It was it was so. This was all before my must, time. Must admit, like it was a lot of training. That's where uh, Will Johnson created the ninety point snitch catch, where you know you get your hand under the legs and get all three balls and one. But, uh, yeah, it was an interesting, interesting time. Something tells me that's not part of the rules. And how the hell did you get in here? Yeah, well, let's see if you can figure this one oh, out. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, I assume there's a button somewhere. Oh, yeah, somewhere. But, yeah, you'll have to look out. Hey! hey oh, you hey, find uh, it. Oh, well done. Yeah. Nice. So this is why I have my engineering degree. Because yeah, so I can solve things in Minecraft. Oh, no fair, fair. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that, well, I mean... Yeah, back to when, um, you know, at the first training session, we were there and um, Emily Waterbridge giving this sort of like big spiel about how tough it's going to be. And we're all there kind of, you know, a little bit sniggering behind her back a little bit, sort of like looking at this little person sort of like walking around, giving it large. Then she took off her fleece and I remember just looking at her arms and thinking, oh my, you know, she was built like, like Schwarzenegger almost. <laughs> <laughs> like looking at, and the first thing she did was she picked out the largest guy who come to this taste as fresh. You know, he was a fresher, like. But she picked out the largest guy she could find and just floored him. What? Like, so like prison, prison style. Prison style. Find the yeah, biggest guy. Like, find the biggest person you can. Like take him down to the ground. Prove that you know. Prove that you you can talk. You can walk the walk and talk the talk and all that. And at that point, I just thought, yeah, this. I I like this. Let's see where this goes. And continue with it. <laughs> I mean, for the first uh, for the first month, actually, I was a chaser. The issue being that I, you know, as I say, I wasn't a very sporty person at all. So mm. I, you know, my fitness was awful. Um, so I couldn't keep up with the other chasers. And back then, the role of beta was was just not really thought of. You used to put your shit players as beta. Like, if you had a player that wasn't really good at anything, you went, well, you can be a beater. Hit someone with this ball. And I mean, so that's that... how I kind of think of beaters. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky you're not on the pitch anymore. But uh, I know, I know. Yeah, so I was put in, a, put in as a beater, and I bloody loved it. I liked hitting people with balls, and I liked not being tackled. Because, again, back then, no one really tackled you as a beater either, because you didn't really have physical players playing as beaters. I think so how was the game back like then? Like for a beater, what was like your what was the thing you used to do? Like when the game starts, what what's your algorithm of acting? I guess I don't know. Well, it's similar to what it is now, um, in the sense of you know you start with your head down. I mean, you had the you had the seeker, uh, the snitch, which uh, used to start at the very beginning, and they would run off pitch somewhere. So like it was different in that way, but for the most part, it's quite similar how the game was actually played. The biggest difference is who the who the beaters were, um, right? Because I mean, back then I'm I'm only five foot eight, um, so I can't remember how much that is in centimeters, but I'm five foot eight, so I'm not a big guy. I'm an inch below average height, and for the okay. first for the first year, I think I was the third tallest beater um, who played competitively in the UK. So I think you only had um, Bex, McCart uh, Bex McGotland, Connor Simpson, and um, Jesus, uh, James Burnett, who were actually taller than me, <laughs> um, which gave me a lot of the time a bit of a physical advantage over a lot of a lot of the other beaters. Like now, if you look, beaters and chasers a lot of the time similar height, similar sizes, similar weight, build, and all that. Back then, as I say, you just put in players that couldn't really play chaser as beaters. So I used to really use that to my advantage, where it just made everything a bit easier for me. 
you know, especially if you look at sort of like the fitness levels um, back then as compared to now. Um, though I say like back then I was very unfit, I was still fitter than most of the other uh, beaters because they were just players that people went, well, we need to put you in at this position. Um, so it meant a lot of the time I could run around the pitch without a lot of tactics and just clear people out, clear things up. Just do whatever the hell you want. Yeah, it was it, like if you look at some of the old videos, like um, uh, White Knights One, I think uh, Banger versus maybe Reading. I spend so much time just around the hoops of Reading, um, just because there was no one there to clear me out. Um, like there, there was a point. I I think it's in um, I think it was the Reading game, or it might have been the Quidlings game, where I just spent the majority of the time in the half just knocking them out and they didn't pass the halfway line for a considerable amount of time because I was just running around there without anyone thinking well maybe one of our beaters should clear him out <laughs> it, was, it was just one of these things where there, it wasn't really thought out I mean um, we so as I said earlier uh, Bangor was the first team to beat Oxford uh, at the time Oxford was the powerhouse of the UK like they were you know, most of the players back then have now gone on to play for teams like Southampton or um, or Raptors or some of the big high-ranking teams. A lot of them have been on Team UK. Like, you know, they're fantastic players. You're thinking like Luke Twist, Ash, um, uh, sort of like Jan, um, one of the best beaters in in my opinion that there's ever been. Uh, what you got, Panda? Like some of these players, absolutely fantastic. But the way that we beat them when we came up against them um, is that we used to... Uh, so before before uh, the pivot became sort of like the standard uh, tactic for beaters, we... Oh, if we want to go to the Chamber of Secrets, I need a book. Um, before the pivot became like the standard for beaters, uh, basically beaters used to just kind of run around the pitch doing not much else. Uh, you know, just I mean, to be beating. fair, that was my style when I tried beating that one time. True. Well, it's you know, it's the most obvious thing for a lot of people to do when, like, you're told, "Oh, you've got a ball, go hit someone." All right, I'm just going to go run around the pitch, hit everyone I can, without tactics. I mean, I used to be very proud of my hit rate. Like again, <laughs> um, my average from the videos from White Knights um, within a game. So the games used to last about 20 minutes or so, or not. You know, similar to now. But within a game, um, my average was about 120. Like, I'd get about 120 beats per game. And I was very proud of that. However, looking back, I can see they're not very tactical, like, the way that I've done it. It's very sort of like, well, there's someone here, I'm going to hit them, I'm going to hit them, I'm going to hit them. And it was just because a lot of people weren't fast. They couldn't run, get out of the way, or what, whatever, like, that was. So, you know, you take advantage of that. Um, mm -hmm. Not gonna lie, I haven't been down here for ages, so I might get lost. <laughs> right. Um, That's what makes it interesting. Yeah, we'll find out. Let's see if I can. This is not it. scripted, so <laughs> yeah. mistakes will happen. Yeah. So I mean, um, before, before um, you know, actual tactical play, the plays were very simple. And what we did when coming up against Oxford, because that was the that was the team that we really planned for, that we wanted to be. Um, we came up with a tactic, and it was what I called the slide, where instead of running madly around the pitch and trying to beat everyone that you can, we basically positioned ourselves one play, you know, side by side on the pitch. One player would be higher up on the pitch, and the other one would be uh, further back. And it was to make people, while they're running, see the first beater, and then list to the other side so that the second beater could actually beat them out. And that's what actually really messed up with Oxford in that first game, where they were used to beaters just running at them willy-nilly. We used that so that we could have a look at, so that when they came down the pitch and they saw a beater and they just thought, oh, move to the left, we actually planned it out so they'd move to the left, uh, move to the right, or move to the left. Or whatever. All right. So they get trapped into it, and the other beater then would stop their beaters from advancing down the pitch. I mean, extremely simple tactic, but back in the day, like, it worked because no one expected the tactic to actually actually be used by the beaters. Um, I mean, fair. 
So how would it? How, how was um? How was it different coming up with the tactic back then and now? I guess. Um. Like. Did well, you, I mean, are you, back then, yeah, there wasn't a lot of competition in tactics, so it meant that if you had if you had a tactic, like regardless of how well it held up to scrutiny, and chances of it being able to to work in situations were a lot higher. So I mean, you come up against teams that just had no idea what they're doing. Like there were, like I remember in one game. Um, I so think, it doesn't differ much from now, does it? Well, sometimes. I mean, you know, you're always going to get a mix of teams, and uh, you know, especially with universities, because they, uh, you know, they cycle through players. You're going to get mm. some people who are more tactically minded, some people who aren't, some people who like fantasy and books and all. And, you know, that does work. I mean, when we, I, I played um, Aberystwyth, their only game they ever played. I played against them in that. Um, they were a terrible team, like just awful. But in the middle of the game, they um, one of them yelled out arrowhead, and they the entire team formed into like an arrow. Like if if, if you've seen the Harry Potter movies, the first one they go in like a you know an arrow formation, the Slytherins and whatnot, and they fly down the pitch kicking people. All and right. This is what Aberystwyth tried to do, not kicking people, but they got themselves into an arrowhead. And they started running down the pitch. Well, what we did, were myself and Jade Saunders, we just stood in front of them and beat them all out as they came down the pitch. So their entire team was beaten out for no purpose. And I think either Andrew or Tom Dutton just picked up the ball and just ran it in before any of them even touched back in. You know, they were a very slow team, but that's as it goes. So, I mean, the tactics, there was a bigger, bigger emphasis on people looking at things like the books and the films and trying to take tactics from that. Because they didn't understand the difference between a sport and you know and fantasy. The game, yeah. yeah. You know, like J.K. Rowling didn't write, you know, the sport. A sports novel. Yeah, she wrote things that you know would be interesting, or you know, the films showed things that were visually pleasing. They didn't want you know. It would have been a far more boring thing if they you know had all the tactics going in the uh, in the movie. I mean, you say that, but to be fair, if, if that team had batons on it, you might it might be a different well, story. Well, or, originally, I thought the beaters would get batons. Um, it's one of the reasons I joined, but uh, alas, that was voted Turned down out very not early. To be the case. Yeah, it's very upset about that. But I, and I hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> right, actually, funny question. So, so was that the dumbest? Okay, so I'm gonna ask you this. Huh. But you have to pick a tactic that obviously does not exist anymore, just because we don't want to piss people off. Tactic. What doesn't. is like, what is the dumbest tactic you've ever seen that's obviously out of date? Well, the dumbest one was probably the uh, the arrowhead. Um, the arrowhead. Just there was no tactical explanation why you'd do it. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of tactics. You know, I've seen I've seen a fair few tactics in my time. Um, I've seen some of the are just stupid but some of them i mean the worst ones really really seem to be the tactics that have some common sense to them but are just performed poorly or i mean this okay. is something that i've been um uh guilty of as well like uh not explaining a tactic so one mm. one of the major things that a lot of people seem to forget is if you don't tell someone why you're doing something they can't really react uh, in a timely manner um, to under uh, to you know follow it through if it doesn't work. Oh uh, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and that that's something I've done online. You know, you get stupid things like that. But the arrow, the arrowhead was one that it's always stuck out to me as just someone who's seen the film and thought, yeah, let's do that. Um, you know that. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Is there one that like used to be kind of well used? Like, it used to be a very big tactic, and now you just think in hindsight, it's like, but why? Um, well, I mean, to, to be honest, um, one like the, as I was saying, like the um, the slide, like, it's not so much looking at tactics and thinking, oh, why did we used to use that? I think a lot of the time for me, it's looking back and thinking, well, why didn't we think of that? Um, okay. Because, like, as I say, like, with the slide, all it was was one person further up the pitch, one person back. And, like, it's such a simple thing. Like, but it took almost a year for us to like figure out where well, if we did this, people are going to react to it like this. And then mm. from that point, the slide kind of became a standard thing for a fair few teams. 
um, up until, I mean, God, it must have lasted for about four years until people thought, well, why don't we pivot? Like, you know, if if this is happening, something that we can do to defend ourselves from other beaters will pivot. And part of that, I think, because uh, the role of beaters has really changed. It went from being mm. virtually a no contact position, uh, you know, or very, very little contact to all of a sudden, you know, players coming in like... Um, like Ben Malpass, who could put in like a very big tackle, or you know, players who traditionally wouldn't tackle him started to put in like bits of contact <clears throat> that people thought, oh, we can no longer rely on our beaters to just um, duel it out with bludgers. They now have to be more physical. Uh, what's the best way to defend ourselves from that? Well, if we move back towards the towards our own goals at that time, we get a bit more defense. And, you know, it kind of snowballs from that. But there's points where you think, well. You know, it's such an obvious thing to think. Well, yeah, let's go back to where we've got more defense. That it's surprising no one really thought of it in the first four years. Um, and for me, I think that's that's a bit a bit more surprising than um, you know some of the stupid tactics that people employed. <laughs> you know, it's just why wouldn't they think of this? Oh God, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you had things where like people like put in put into their tactical plays. Oh, I'll jump through the hoop. And, you know, I've seen people jump through the hoop and things like that, like showboating, or I think I've seen it once in a game. So, you know, I, in the first, like, year or two, I genuinely saw people trying to, you know, losing a goal because they thought, well, tactically it works if I jump through this hoop. And it oh, just... so it wasn't like a show-off thing. It was literally, it's yeah, what it was, called tactic. It was literally, because, I mean, like, now we've got the rule that, um, you know, you can't jump into contact. Back then, mm. you could jump into contact. Like, you know, you could leap, you know, you could leap and go for it. And people thought, well, I'm not particularly strong. I can't brute force my way through this. So what I'll do to compensate is I'll jump. Um, and I don't think I ever saw, oh shit, creeper. I don't think I Run. ever saw someone um, successfully do it. I There's saw... two of them. Oh shit. I don't I'll know try why they... I don't know why they spawn in there, but... Uh, do they always spawn there? There's a fair few of them that do. There we go. Jesus. Um, but yeah. Um, so I saw a fair few people try it. don't think I ever saw someone do it successfully as like a tactical decision. But yeah, that's it on the stupid ones, really. I mean, as I say, you know, you got a lot of people who they try tactics that they thought out and thought through, but they just don't work. Like, um... You get a lot of people who forget that, you know, their players aren't world-class athletes. Mm. So, like, come up with this amazing, you know, complex tactic that really requires on people being able to run about 20 miles an hour, like, sustained, never dropping the ball and being able to throw, you know, a good 100 meters. And you're like, well, that's never going to really work, is it, in our, in our situation? Like, I've had very good success with... Um, the uni teams I've played for, you know, I've played for Bangor, Chester, Manchester, um, and each mm -hmm. team that I've played for <coughs> and um, helped coach. They, they, well, you know, I, li I like to, I like to claim this is all me, but you know, there a lot of things go into it. But each time they've all rose in the ranks. Um, well, Bum Bar Bangor, which you know we we were high in the ranks because that's where it started. But Chester and Manchester, they rose high in the ranks when I helped coach them out. And a lot of that, I think, is because we just simplified the tactics, you know. Oh yeah, I do. I do remember that was that was kind of my glory days. Where I mean, to be fair, it's the only time I properly played. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. it's just run, run straight. Use your big size. Like, oh, nice. But yeah, but that's the thing. I, I like the sport. A lot of the times, you know, a lot of the teams when they start out, they try and do something complex, or they try and go into tactics that. Really, like if you look at the Raptors, you've got players there who have been playing. You know, a lot of them have been playing eight years, like me, or you know, a bit shorter or longer, or however many. But they're players who have drilled and trained and trained and tried a lot of things. When you've got a team that you know, a lot of them have been playing for a year or a freshers or whatever level they're at, expecting them to play and perform at the same level as a team like that just isn't really realistic. So you do, you know, the best chance you have is to really simplify what you're going with. Um, you know, like, 
if I'm training a you know if I'm training a not very experienced team as beaters, one thing I'll do is I'll give I'll only train two tactics with them, or oh, well, mm-hmm. two defensive, two offensive, and the idea there is just you get really good at these two simple things, and then after that we can look at you know we can look at bigger tactics to try this or that or if you need to get that but once you've got the basics then you can go and make bigger tactics a lot of teams try and jump straight okay. into these you know crazy more tactics. complex stuff yeah i mean fair i think that they just think it'll give them a little bit of an edge but you, you got to make sure you know your basics otherwise oh god yeah otherwise it just all goes down the window but i mean the basics you Out know the window most of the time, you know, especially like in Merc tournaments or playing against a team that really is an experienced or a very high ranking team, most of the time I, I just go back to very simple basics because they're low, you know, they're low effort, low pressure, and you can just pull them off. And if a team doesn't know how to react to the basics or aren't trained, aren't trained sufficiently to defend against them, you know, they work so well that you can't just walk them uh, walk some of these teams without really having to put a lot of pressure mm-hmm. on yourself so what's this where are we are right now um well i suppose this is an attic room i don't know okay it's just yeah, another so if, bit so if you want we could just walk around if you what was the thing you were going to build so we can continue um, so as long as I there's no more secrets that you remember, show i mean us. i was building well i need to get a lot of glass I, the last thing i built was the, i have uh, some glass oh have you got there. glass <gasps> yay Cool. It's not much, it's six, but... Six. Well, I can multiply that into 16. Maybe. Nice. Yeah, but, um... Yeah. That's really on the tactics, really. Like, as I say, just... The more simple... The simpler you keep the tactics, the better you're going to perform most of the time. Like, even yeah. if you look at... Yeah, because less things to go wrong. Oh, God, yeah. Like, even if you look at the Raptors, like... For most of their tactics that they use you're never going to have more than about four moving parts mm. like for every every extra step you add in it's an extra chance that it's going to bugger up like, yeah true you know so it's yeah, just turning into a tactical discussion with sam <laughs> i like it i might actually learn a thing or two no oh, maybe maybe <laughs> yeah. finally get some tactics yeah. down well, it's the same thing when i teach beaters uh, so i tell them that sam yeah what what Go on. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying, when I teach beaters, I teach them that when you're defending, count the amount of moves it would take for an opposing player to score, and that's how much priority you should give them. Like, you know, if it takes one move, you know, if all it's going to take is for them to throw the ball, ooh, they've scored, then they're high priority. If it's going to take mm-hmm. two moves, like they're going to have to run to the side a bit to get a good aim, then shoot, that's two, so still high priority, but less. If they're right at the side and they've got no chance of shooting and scoring, and they're going to have to pass it to someone else who then has to... So they have to make a pass, someone catches it, that person then has to run and then has to score with four moves. They're quite low priority. Like, so you can figure it out like that. And at that point you can then start thinking, well, how how's a decent defense got set up? So did you have like, um, I guess, a eureka moment or something where you were like, I'm ready to coach people, I'm ready to, you know add something to the sport like did you have a moment like that or do you just kind of go well i've been playing this game for a while so instead of just playing you were ready to teach so was it that or was it just like well i kind of played it for a long time i might as well you know coach people well what happened is basically because i like because as i say the sport was so new there weren't any you know beating was something that you it's not really like no other no other sport really has a position like beaters mm. that um when i was playing with banger basically it meant that um we didn't have beat coach the we had a we had right. a guy who he was i mean he's had nothing to do with quidditch for a long time so i don't think he's going to hear this so i'm going to describe him as a weirdo um huh. he was he was odd um but he he was a good speaker he was quite captivating as a speaker um and he, you know, he got me into it and he was towing it. But, you know, he used to be one of these people, as I said, like, he would come up with these ridiculous tactics that had too many steps to them, just weren't really realistic. Um, but yeah, but, um, you know, he'd come up with these ridiculous tactics and it was ridiculous. But he was only there for about three months and then he disappeared. Um, All right. And at that point, that just kind of left me and Jade Saunders. 
um, kind of adds the beaters for the team. And like as I said, like we used to spend the entire match, you know, we would spend entire matches on the pitch. Sometimes like, you know, be there for two or three matches, just me and Jade. Um, we had a couple of other beaters who were also sort of like involved, but you used to really partner with one beater and then that would be it. You'd just be, oh, that's my partner beater, let's go with it. But it left us kind of without any um, instruction. So eventually we just kind of started training ourselves, doing it how we wanted to do, practicing different things. You know, because we were the actual players, we could go, well, this seems to work whenever we play this game. This doesn't seem to work. Let's try that. Let's try and then eventually it just kind of, um, I, I, I was, I was pretty good, um, back then. I, I was, I was a pretty good beater. It just <laughs> kind of developed into me then training the team's beaters and being the, the beater coach for Banger. And that was within probably about the first six months or so of me playing. Um, so I never really had a proper coach, so I had to do a lot of learning about it. Um, okay. And like, I, I don't think I'm what someone would call like a good coach. I'm just knowledgeable about the sport. Um, you know, I, I was never a sports person. I was never what I call a sports coach. Probably more of a life coach, I think, when I come to the Beatles. <laughs> but um, doing it like that, um, it wasn't until the year after when we played Chester for the first time. Um, that I was actually, I was looking and I was spotting and I was thinking, well, you know, these are some things they could improve on. This is how they could uh, maybe improve on it and things like that. And that's when I really started to um, look into coaching properly and sort of like thinking, well, how do we improve? How do we rank people? How do we do this? Um, that's probably okay. the, the Eureka moment, playing Chester, I think. Okay. So what? So how long have you been coaching now then? Um, so well, seven and six, about seven, seven years. years yeah. yeah, about seven years. Been so, playing. So how do you actually? Yeah. Seven and a half. Been coaching about <laughs> seven. Okay, that's good. So, so like, how? I'm gonna say like, how are you gonna? How do you stay relevant in terms of like, how do you keep up with the tactics that are going? Like, how do you keep um, finding something to teach? How do I about? stay relevant? Um, I don't know if I have. <laughs> uh, um, so I think a lot of it is looking at how the sport's developing. Um, mm. and sort of like seeing, you know, um, I was very lucky about three years ago. Um, I was asked to go commentate the uh, European Cup, and at that point, you know, um, I was asked because uh, uh, Sally Higginson, she's a good friend. Um, she was uh, helping run the tournament, and she just, I think, she just wanted someone she knew about. So she asked me, which you know, I was, I was flattered. Um, though it was the wrong tournament, I thought I was going to the uh, the European Cup. I was going to the European Games. Um, so, you know, I was a bit confused about it. But at that point, going back, watching it and seeing sort of like how high level teams are performing. Because it had been, mm-hmm. been about three years since I'd been on a, a high performing team at that point. It was it was just a point where it's sort of like, oh, shit, I'm actually behind the times here. I need to I need to think about this a bit more. Um, oh, what have you got there? Uh, I don't know. Getting, what did I get? Getting an upgrade. Oh, I got a stone pickaxe because I've never actually gotten a stone pickaxe. Oh, bloody oh, great. Nice. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho, ho. oh, that reminds me. I've got a, I've got a diamond pickaxe for you. I meant to give you. Ow. Ooh. Did I doing? hit you? Yeah, you hit me. What are you doing? Sorry. I'm just trying to make it nicer. Do you reckon stone would be better? Breaking up my path. Um, I like I made the path. as path. Okay. I'll, I'll stick it to that then. Uh, you know, I think that's one use for cobblestone. But, um, what was I talking about? Yeah, so sort of like seeing that and sort of like realizing, oh, actually, I've kind of let myself go here a bit and tactically. Um, because, you know, I, I used to be very proud of my tactics. I, I, you know, I created quite a few of the beta tactics that the UK use that I was, mm-hmm. you know, so I was quite proud of that. And then realizing that, oh, actually, you know, spending all my time doing very simplistic tactics with uni teams, I've, forgotten how to play at the big leagues so i had to go back and sort of like relearn a lot of the things there that's kind of a normal way to like especially when you stay in the sport for this long because it's not like football and football i guess tactics don't change as quickly as they do in quidditch because i mean you've got many many teams in there all trying to adapt to each other but here it's kind of like you come up with a tactic and then someone comes up with this and you're like wow so because that's like one of the things i really liked about you is the fact that you never just try to teach us like, okay, we're going to stick with whatever and that's it. Like, cause that's how we done in my days. It was always like, 
oh shit, we used to do this, and like, oh crap, it's not working. Right, let's think of something else. Because so that's what that's what I found really cool about you. I think that's why I actually started liking you as a coach. And <laughs> well, I think I think a lot of it's you know it's a bit of an arms race, really. You know, someone comes mm-hmm. up with a good defensive tactic, you gotta figure out a way to break it. Someone comes up with a way to break it, you gotta figure out a way to defend from it. Um, I mean, a lot of what I I do a lot of the time is I do look at all the tactics, you know, things that mm-hmm. people have kind of forgotten or sort of like think, oh, well, that doesn't work anymore, and look at it in a sense of, well, actually, does this older, more simplistic tactic work against this new, this new thing that people are defending from, or? You can look at it like that. Um, I mean, I relied on that probably a bit too much, I think, especially when I was at Manchester. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'd I'd rely on very uh, long yet and going, well, at the moment, the physicality of the beaters is going down. So what we can do to, you know, face that, we can have a look at some of the older tactics that relied on beaters not getting physical. Or the physicality of the beaters in the country is going up. Let's look at some of the tactic you know you can look at it like that and sort of like take from the older tactics and i think i'm i'm just lucky that i've been around so long that i've seen all the older tactics i can take and adapt some of those um so it does work but you know it's sort of like um there's very few that are 100 percent new tactics now a lot of them they've oh, all yeah. got they've all got roots and if you know where the roots are and you know why they had to change you can then figure out well there was a weakness there because of this um, but again, so like also like with the Olympians now, uh, there's a bit more scope to move with the tactics. Like you know, one of the things that I do with the beaters with the Olympians that I couldn't really do with a lot of the uni teams, and this is just because of a bit of experience, because they've been playing long enough that they can, you know, they can do some things um, off the bat without having to think about it. I can then diversify what they are thinking about. So you know, like I get the beaters to look at you know, look at the side, the hand that the other players are holding the ball with, they're more likely to be it. So if a player is right-handed, they're more likely to be able to hit someone with a bludger if they're straight in front of them or to their left. If you go on their right side, throwing a ball outwards is actually incredibly difficult. So if you're coming down the pitch and you can look and you can go, well, that beater defending on the left side of the pitch they're right-handed, that means if I stay on their right-hand side, there's less chance of them hitting me. You can actually look at more specific um, instances and start using um, start using that to your advantage, as opposed to saying, well, generally, we generally as a tactic, you know, if we're stood side by side, it's going to be difficult for people to get to us, generally. Um, you can do that, but then once you really know the basics, you can go, well, more specifically on this player, I can see their weakness on this side. I can see that. And then you incorporate that into your own tactics. You, um, it just gives you a bit more of a bit more of a percentage of coming out on top. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to the percentage of how likely it is that you're going to win. Okay. So what do you think, um, you know, from the community teams and stuff, so what do you think we can actually do to help uni teams in terms... Because like you said, they don't really... So you start off fresh, most of them, and they need to be taught the basics. But what can teams like, well, the community teams can do to actually help the uni teams take a, you know, step up? Because you have, basically, sometimes you have a year to coach a team up because you have, you lose people at the start and at the end of the seasons. So, like, what, what, so yeah, what can community teams do? I don't think it's a case of, you know, teaching uni teams to step it up or anything like that. I think mm-hmm. it's it's a case of, talking talking to uni teams and so i you know visiting have you know having little training sessions having chats with players you know especially like if you're if you're a uni student and you want to learn so you know as i say like i've got my advantage is that i've been in the game for so long that i've seen these tactics come and go that i can sort of like look and go well i remember this tactic i remember why it was flawed we can take advantage of that or i remember why this Mm -hmm. worked you know, a lot of teams, as you say, if you've only been in it for a year, you haven't got that back catalogue of knowledge. Yeah. So I think it's very important and I think only fair for community teams to actually, you know, share that knowledge with a lot of um, uni teams. 
I mean, I, I know at the moment, like um, with the Olympians, we, we go and do joint training sessions and, you know, we're, we're trying to set up like um, a bit of a coach mentoring system where mm -hmm. essentially just, you know, it's, it's essentially just asking questions, but having someone that, you know, will always respond and someone that, you know, knows your team a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, giving resources, um, actually being willing to chat and be proactive in going over and sort of like having a look at some of these teams. Because I know, you know, like when I was in, when I was at Bangor, if someone came over to us and they started like trying to coach us and this and that, we, you know, we'd get defensive. Like it'd be the, yeah, I know that. And, you know, it's some of these, some of these teams that we've gone to even after being asked with uh, the Olympians. Like, um, there was one player who, you know, their team asked us to go and uh, coach. And this player, they they were having a bit of trouble. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I was trying to coach them and all that. And they, you know, they were giving me attitude all, all the way through it. And then at, um, at DevCop this year, that player actually came out and saw, you know, they actually came over to me and thanked me for giving them some tips and all that. And I thought they absolutely hated my guts. <laughs> like, you know, the way that they responded to when I was trying to coach them, I thought, oh, God, okay, this player just isn't responsive. They they obviously don't mm. like me. They think that I think I'm the big I am and come over to tell them what, you know, how to suck eggs. But <laughs> at the end of it, you know, they went and they played and, you know, they, they did well. And they came over, thanked me. And, you know, that was the sweetest thing, like, for me. That was just, you know, really bloody nice. But, um... You know, they did themselves. They did themselves proud. And I think a big thing for the community teams is just realizing that, you know, a lot of these teams with newer players or with players that have only been playing a short amount of time, they don't necessarily know how to train. Like, yeah. And I think a lot of community players they forget that when they were at uni, they didn't know how to train. They didn't know how to do. That's it. true. Yeah. Like yeah. you know. Some of these players, they've spent ages, and you know, rightly so. Like, you look at Jay Holmes; like he he put in so much effort into learning how to coach. He put in so much effort into studying the actual mechanics of the game and studying. You know, he I would class him as a ge as a genius within Quidditch. Like he's brilliant. I love the lad. Uh, you know, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, we used to trick <laughs> him into coming over and switching on the lights when we couldn't be asked getting <laughs> off the sofa. But um, yeah, I'm glad you didn't know. do it to us because I'm pretty sure I would have either. Uh... I would well, have quit. You, you would have taken too long to do it, mate. You and your limp. But um, hey, I didn't have a limp back then. <laughs> you would have done if you didn't do it quick knees. enough. But, so, um, actually, funny story. Just sorry, before, just to interrupt you a little bit. I actually didn't have a single injury before joining Quidditch. Yeah, it, you know, not like, a single thing. So who would have known? Not even like a pulled muscle this or anything. Fledgling sport with a bad, bad um, health and safety ratings would do that to yeah. a to a person. Yeah, my my parents hate the sport now. I can understand, <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> So I think, you know, I, I think a big thing is just being very friendly with the uni teams, getting to know them yeah. and realizing that, you know, we were in their boat. Um, now we got to figure yeah. it out. Like, I, I think separating uni and community teams will be a bad idea because that... You, you know, reckon it'll distance? I, I reckon that will distance it massively. I think mm -hmm. it basically it heightens the idea that community teams are somehow inherently better than uni teams. This yeah. isn't true. Like, you've got the right, likes of Raptors and Werewolves, who, you know, um, they're amazing teams. They're teams with players who, you know, have been playing a long time, and they're very, very good. However, mm -hmm. you've also, like, you know, I, I have no shame in saying that the uh, the Olympians are what I class as a high mid-range team. Like, oh, no, yeah, definitely. You know, we're not in, we're not in the leagues of the Raptors or the, um, or the Werewolves or what you call it, the teams like that. Where you know that's just not our style. We're we're not you know. Yeah. It'd be lovely to be able to say, oh, we're as good as them. We're in the same. We're not. So you know, with I us, think we, we can be within like maybe, but given two or three more years, definitely. <laughs> and um, some additions. Well, I mean, well, with some additions, we have and potential. If we, and if we didn't take so many injuries, maybe. But you oh, know, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's not yeah. what the target of the team is, though. Is it? It's like you know, we want the sport no, to live. I... Like for me, the main thing is making sure that the sport continue continues on. And I think mm. by having um, a separation, what you do is you're limiting the knowledge that gets naturally shared. And by doing that, you're setting the sport back massively. Um, you know, it basically resets the clock to like 2012. 
really, where mm. people don't really understand tactics. People are, you know, they're playing at a certain level, but that level just stagnates. And, yeah. You know, so I think, you know. But then again, on the other hand, you can, you can, you can see it as if you're, if you're a uni team, right? And you're drawn against Raptors. So let's say you're a second team of a team, you know, th- these are the players that sometimes just, you know, they want to have fun. They, they come to trainings, they want to enjoy with their friends and then they go into a tournament and they meet Raptors and you have absolutely no chance. So uh, sometimes you can just see how well, yeah, people but think that separating is a good idea. Put it this way. You, so if you go to Northern, say Manchester goes to Northern and they get drawn up against Edinburgh, have they got a chance? Mm. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a similar thing. It's, you get drawn up against a good team. You get drawn up against a good team. It's a shame. You know, Edinburgh um, is a team that very, very likely could and at some point will beat um, the Olympians. Like, playing against them was incredibly difficult. I think, you know, it, w- it was a swim game. It was difficult. Uh, they beat... Did they beat... Um, did they beat Megs? Who beat the Megs? Yeah, we beat Megs, but I think... Didn't Edinburgh also beat Megs? Us, we. Us, we, who? Olympians. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah. think they did, yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, that's a university team beating a community team. Like, yeah. in London, um, I think SQC three or two or whatever they also got beaten by them like you know there are teams who do run in the pack that uh, you know like us the olympians run that is a step down from as i say you know like the raptors the Mm -hmm. werewolves and all that but that is still a high level and all you do really by separating uni and community teams is you just make the high level a little bit lower but for a lot of teams that's still at the moment unattainable without having people come in, helping them train, giving them the base knowledge that a lot of these teams have. I mean, if you look at Chester and um, Edinburgh, they're long-standing teams who have retained a lot of their player base. Um, I believe Chester, if it was forced to get rid of its community players, would probably collapse. But that's that's one of the things. I think you, it muddies the sport a bit when you're starting to sort of like go, well, because you can't beat this one team, you're going to do this one. But I think what would be better than splitting it is to actually have a reform. Like if, you know, we've already we've already got a, a rule that's based on assumption, which is, you know, the gender rule, where it assumes, mm-hmm. oh, a, um, a firm female at birth players are smaller than male players. Therefore, we have to make this rule and whatnot. But, you know, that's a rule that's based on assumption that people say, well, certain players can do certain things. So if we base another rule, you know, it's just a tournament rule, really, not even a game rule, a tournament rule, you know, something along the lines of um, community play, community teams are assumed to have more experienced players. Therefore, if they break a rule or commit a foul, that's more, that's more um, penalizable than if a uni team or yeah, but a fresher wouldn't commits that, that complicate foul. the refing procedure then even further. I wouldn't say it would complicate the refing. Oh shit! Um, I ah, say... you also blew the thing up now. Oh shit! I wouldn't say it would be a case of refing. Uh, you know, the refs would continue exactly as the same. What you do is you you change the way that the tournaments run. So you know, if within a game, like a player gets a, a yellow card and whatnot, who happens to be on a community team, then that's fair enough. Mm-hmm. You know, they continue playing the game. It's entirely fair. But then after it. When the tournament, uh, when the when that game's over and it goes back to the tournament structure, and they're looking at it. But I mean, like, so what you do with with the tournament is essentially, you know, like um, in tournaments at the moment, if you get a straight red card, that's a match ban. Yeah. Well, you do it with um, community teams. If they get two yellow cards, that's a match ban. So Ooh. you know they continue playing the game that they got the cards in perfectly fine, but then the next match they're banned from playing. And that would just be for community teams because the assumption is, well, you should know the game better. You shouldn't be making these fouls, these mistakes. And I think what that would do in the early stages of a tournament, that would really um, put a lot of community teams into being a lot more careful about how they choose to play. Because I know um, there's a big, you know, I'm not going to name which team that people are scared of. I know, especially in the north, there was a big thing about um, players not wanting to play a certain team because they. Don't worry, I'll put it on the screen because. I think, why not? <laughs> but, you know, like, players are not wanting to play a certain team because they felt like, oh, that's a good chance of them getting fouled or injured. Yeah. If, you know, if you're playing for Manchester and you come up against a team like this and you're worried about playing them, 
if you have the knowledge that actually if they, you know, if one of their players gets two yellow cards or whatever, you know, whatever way it was decided that they're going to go, that that team's now going to be more careful against you because you're not a high priority for them, then that gives you a bit more confidence to be able to play and go, well, we're going to try our best. We're going to go into this. Mm. Because, you know, if they if they decide that they're going to play hard against you and that they get, you know, th- you know, three of their players get, you know, three yellow cards and they're banned from banned from the next game, which then could be like a high ranking game or whatever, they're not going to want to risk it against you. So it does. Okay, yeah. It gives them more of an incentive to go, well, let's, you know, let's tone it down a bit in the early stages of the tournament. Then when you get to the later stages, you know, like the semifinals and finals and things like that. You know, collecting a card there won't be the same, you know, won't have the same um, same risk. You know, like if it's a case of the cards stack over games. So like if you get two two yellow cards over games and then you get a match ban. Well, if you get your first yellow card in the semifinals, the finals and you get a second yellow card, doesn't really matter then, does it? But if it's a case of you get a yellow card early on day two, then you get a yellow card on like the first, you know, if you get a yellow card on day one, then a yellow card on the first game of day two, that could really bug you up. So, yeah. you know, it makes teams and players actually think, well, let's be more careful to avoid these cards. To be fair, that's cool. I've never actually heard of something as nice. Yeah, well, Should that's what, it. that's what I did propose. Like, but, oh, you know, okay, it gets wow. poo-pooed, didn't it? Because, you know, I think part of, part of the idea with the split of community and um, uni teams is... I get the feeling from some players that they don't feel challenged or they don't feel like the game's worthy playing against teams that aren't what they consider their level or close to it. Mm. And it's it's a big learning curve for a lot of teams to play against a, a high-ranking or top-ranking team. And I think that's very important to maintain. But yeah, definitely, yeah. I, you know, I, I think there are some players who feel that for them it's not worth playing a game that they don't think has has a competitive edge to it. And I think that's wrong, to be honest. But um, I think by by giving more of a punishment to community teams in terms of penalties and cards, you know, it's it's just a tournament structure thing. It's not actually a gameplay uh, change. Yeah. It's a tournament structure. It gives them more of an incentive to play in, play in a way that's uh, a bit more uh, attainable by university teams when they come up against them. And that, that's really okay. what my change would be. Because I think, you know, the thing that's kept me in the sport is the community of it. And I think splitting it yeah. as it is at the moment, you risk just destroying that. Um, just in the sense of um, outside, you know, in the community teams, it's it's pretty much trying to change it so that they have to be uber competitive. They have to be mm. constantly striving for the best of the best. And, you know, in the sport, though that you want, you know, I, I always want to win. I, you know, I never go into something thinking, oh, I want to lose this. Like, you always want to win, but you have to have that balance and sort of like thinking, well, what's fun for me? What's this? I think especially yeah. with like um, the Olympians, where it's more based around, you know, friends and you know, actually having fun, you know, like the Chan friends, friends, Wait, fun, friends? fun or whatnot. Like genuinely, yeah, well, well maybe not you, <laughs> but, um, you know, the rest of them, like, I like Matt. Um, <laughs> you know, things like that. I think once you get into the this thought of, oh, well, we have to be the best, we have to always be competitive, and, you know, we always have to be striving for the best and the best, and we won't face anyone who's below our level, you really lose the the actual feeling of the community of it. I mean, yeah. that's why I, I stuck around. Like, that's why I think the sport's very important because it's the only place, really, that, you know, it holds up uh, men and women to the same, uh, you know, very much the same standard. It gives, like, it gives opportunity for people who traditionally be marginalized in other sports. Um, and yeah. I think part of that is to make sure that that feeling and that, that expression of community and acceptance continues after people leave university. And yeah, yeah, yeah. for me, I think splitting the university and community teams risks kind of breaking that open a little bit in terms of, you know, looking at it and thinking, well, let's try and make it this professional sport. Like, it's it's not a professional sport. It's, it's fucking Quidditch. Like, you know, I think... Yeah, but at the same time, I do get the argument that we wanted to make it more... No, prof- I think professional is the wrong word for it because, like, 
be honest, none of us are professional and we'll never be professional. We can be good, but but what I'm asking is what what's the point of doing that? Like, at well, the I moment, think it's for people that that are at a high level for them to be even more validated. So why don't they go I play guess? football or rugby or something like that? If they want to do that, if you want to change the sport, then there yeah, are thousands of other sports that you can play that are already that. What we've got at the moment is we've got a place where people traditionally who aren't sporty can come get fit, can meet people. You know, this has helped a lot of people come, uh, you know, come out in a lot of cases. It's helped um, get people who traditionally wouldn't be allowed to play certain sports into actually playing sports. And it's, you know, um, I don't have any granite, sorry. And it's also, Uh. you know, helped a lot of people get fit in certain cases like me i couldn't run a, when i first joined quidditch i couldn't run 100 meters like i used to throw okay. up but like because of the sport it actually got me thinking it got me playing it got me doing something i loved it it helped with my fitness it, you know i think it's added years onto my lifespan by actually just <laughs> playing the damn thing but you know so i think it's it's a very special very special sport in its own way where it helps a lot of people in ways that other sports just can't. And I think if you start changing it and you make it all about, well, we have to be the best of the best and we have to push it and make it like every other sport, you lose that. And I think that would Mm. be a terrible, terrible thing to lose. 